It turns out that there are two ways that atoms can join together to form compounds. They can either form what are called covalent bonds with other atoms, water is one example where this happens, or they can form what are called ionic bonds with other atoms, like they do in salt, NaCl. In this episode, we're going to look at covalent bonding. So let's begin. In this chemical reaction between hydrochloric acid and magnesium, hydrogen gas is being produced. In hydrogen gas, the hydrogen atoms always join up in pairs, and we write the chemical formula as H2. So the question is, why do hydrogen atoms always join up in pairs, and what makes them join together? Let's look at a simple diagram of a hydrogen atom. It has one positively charged proton in its nucleus, well, the proton is, in this case, its nucleus, and the negatively charged electron moves around the nucleus at really high speeds. There's a force of attraction between the proton and the electron, since they have opposite charges. Let's simplify things further by just showing the electron stationary in its electron shell. Now, the proton here is attracting the electron, but that doesn't mean that it can't also attract another electron that's part of another hydrogen atom. If a second H atom happens to come along, and it bumps into our first H atom, then our original proton will also attract the electron of the second H atom. Now that also means that the proton of our second H atom is close enough to attract the electron of the first H atom. So it becomes a kind of two-way tug of war, because the pair of electrons is attracted by both of the nuclei. As a result, the atoms bond together in a stable arrangement, and they stay together. This type of bonding, where pairs of electrons are mutually attracted by the nuclei of two different atoms, is called covalent bonding. A molecule, by definition, is any group of two or more atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. It's a bit like two hobbiters fighting over a ring. They both want it, and neither wants to let go. So, the two hobbiters are bound together by their mutual attraction to the ring. However, unlike a fight over the one ring, the tug of war between the two atoms nearly always involves two rings, uh, two electrons, one from each atom. So now, each electron shell doesn't have just one electron in it. Each electron shell has two electrons in it, its original electron and the one that has been attracted. As we saw in our last episode, two is the maximum number of electrons that the first shell of an atom can actually hold. So both electron shells are now full. It turns out that having a full outer shell is particularly stable, and atoms tend to chemically react with other atoms until their outer shells are full. Hydrogen atoms therefore never exist on their own. As soon as individual H atoms are produced in a chemical reaction, they link up in pairs, so hydrogen as a gas is always H2. The electrons are actually constantly moving in a kind of random figure eight pattern but we usually just represent the electron arrangement like this because it's so much easier. So what happens if a third hydrogen atom comes along? Well, its electron is repelled by the two electrons that are already there, and no reaction takes place. Of course, that's not to say that hydrogen gas isn't reactive. As we saw in episode 2 of our series, it's flammable, which means it is reactive. But you have to heat it up with, say, a burning match before it'll start to burn because H2 molecules are a whole lot less reactive than single hydrogen atoms, which join together as soon as they're produced in a chemical reaction. Hydrogen molecules, H2, are the simplest of all molecules. Let's now look at water, a slightly more complicated example. Now, even though all electrons are identical, we'll colour code them so that you can more easily see what's going on. Oxygen has two electrons in its inner shell and six electrons in its outer shell. However, the outer shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. If a hydrogen atom crashes into it, the hydrogen atom's nucleus attracts this electron into its electron shell, and the oxygen atom's nucleus attracts this electron into its outer shell, and the two atoms form a bond. However, the oxygen atom's outer shell can hold one more electron, since right now it has only seven, six blue and one pink. An atom with seven electrons in its outer shell is just not stable. That is, it's very reactive. If another hydrogen atom comes close, 
the two nuclei attract each other's electrons and another bond is formed. The oxygen atom now has eight outer shell electrons, the six blue electrons that it had, plus the two pink ones that it managed to attract. This is the maximum number that it can hold. The hydrogen atoms now have two electrons in their outer shells, the pink ones that they started with and the blue ones that they've attracted, and so their shells are full as well. This arrangement is stable. In fact, whenever atoms bond covalently with other atoms... We hope you've enjoyed watching this short excerpt from Shedding Light on Atoms, Episode 7, Covalent Bonding. The Shedding Light on Atoms series teaches students all the basics of chemistry and of atomic theory and explains how we know what we know about these things. In this episode, we look at how atoms can bond together with what are called covalent bonds and explain the differences between single, double and triple bonds. We show students how an atom's electron configuration affects the number of bonds it can make and then introduce structural formulas. We finish by acquainting students with the basics of organic chemistry. You can read and download a transcript of the program and its accompanying student worksheet on our website. Thanks for watching.